Right. Turn with me to Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. And uh, we're going to read from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, and charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works." Let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks and praise that we are able to gather and study your word this morning. We pray that as we read through these scriptures and look at the various cross-references, you will teach us what you will have us to know through your preserved word as we read it, as we believe it, and as we trust it. We thank you for this in and through Christ Jesus. Amen. So the Apostle Paul, writing here to Timothy, a young man, and giving him certain instruction. And we can see in Second Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace. Now, Timothy was not Paul, his biological son, but he calls him his son. He's his son in the faith. He's his son in the word. He guided and helped and taught Timothy, and Timothy had spent time with him, and when he writes to him, he says, my son. You know, the scriptures say, you and I, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and so therefore, as we gather today, you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm your brother in Christ, and for those of you who are live online with us now or listening to this after the event, anyone who is a believer and trusts in the, the fact that Christ paid for their sin on the cross, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, is a brother or sister in Christ. We are part of the body of Christ. And so Paul, writing to young Timothy here now, gives him certain instruction. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 books. Second Timothy was the last of the books that he wrote, which make up part of the canon of Scripture. And as Paul pins Second Timothy, Paul is very much aware that he is suffering and going to suffer further persecution and no doubt lose his life. And he's giving these final instructions to Timothy. He's literally a handing over the baton kind of thing to say, look, this is, this is what's going to, you know, these are the ones that are now going to, he knows he's going to carry forth the word of life. And he gives Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, two letters he writes to Timothy. He writes to Titus and Philemon as well. He writes directly to these folk. And by implication today, Timothy, was Timothy, he's, he calls him his son, but was he his brother in Christ? Yes. And so by extension today, do we take this to us? Yes, we do. There is instruction here. He's writing to Timothy, a young pastor, and he gives him instructions. But to you and I today, as we gather, we need to take heed of this. Now, notice verse 10 where he says, but. Now, if there's a but, that means some information was given, but I'm giving you this, but this is the case. What information is he giving him? Well, drop down to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, 
truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now I ask you, when you look at the world today, is that not what we're seeing? Are these the things, and Paul, 2,000 years ago, writing to Timothy and saying, Timothy, these are the things that are going to happen in the last days. Paul the Apostle was not aware how long the age of grace would be. We've had 2,000 years of God's grace. And Paul was not aware of how long that was going to be. In Paul's mindset, it could have happened in his lifetime or very soon after his, his departing. So he's giving Timothy this instruction and saying, Timothy, these things are going to happen. And he doesn't say, go find a cave, crawl in there, hide, get away, do whatever. He says, these things are going to happen. And then he goes on further and he says, uh, verse 4, traitors, heady, high, uh, you know, that, that people just thinking of themselves, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Oh, yes, sure, looking very religious, doing a lot of religious things, but denying the power thereof, denying the essence and the truth. I had some visitors again on Saturday. I don't know what it is with the area we stay in. Maybe there's somebody who's part of the, the group that, that is in the area that decides that's the training ground for these young folk that need to go two by two and share um, the message of Jehovah and come knocking on our doors. And uh, it it's happen, happens often. So I've now taken to say, well, that's fine. You've knocked on my door. I will have a discussion with you. And it's sad because they are so indoctrinated with the doctrine that they, 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 they have this way of very carefully bringing you to a point and ask you a lot of questions. So I let them ask me two or three questions, and then I say, can I ask you some questions now? Well, you've asked me three. Can I ask you three? And I then start posing questions. I say, have you considered this scripture? Have you considered that scripture? And then I say, well, do you mind if I go and get my Bible? Um, some of them say, no, 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 don't worry, or... But, and, and, and it is sad for me when I hear the way that, yes, but you know, we do believe in Jesus. I said, yes, but is he God? No. And I said, therein is the big difference. And when we discuss these things, and when I start asking questions, then normally I get the answer. I don't, we don't really want to get into a big discussion and a debate. And I said, well, but you've come to me now. So let's discuss these things. I said, because if I'm right and you wrong, you are going to go to a lost eternity. That's the reality. And so when you look at the, and, and, and I thought of this verse because, um, you know, in having prepared the message in the week and these folks arriving there, and I think to myself, I have to be careful that I don't come across myself as heady, high-minded and thinking I know everything. But my genuine care and concern is I'm looking at these two young men and I'm thinking, you are going to go to a lost eternity. That's the reality. And I could say, oh, please, I don't have time now. And I say, please, you have to consider Consider 1 John 5 verse 7. Consider this, this scripture. And then they will quote me a scripture. And I said, yes, brilliant. But have you read on? And so when you look at this, and this is the kind of thing that we find happening. And, you know, it's, it's because read down. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. Bringing false doctrine. And folks, you have to make a, a decision as to who is going to be your final authority. And if I could say, what is your final authority? It has to be the written, preserved word of God. Now, these folks claim as well. And I said, well, that's fine. Then let's take the scripture and let the scripture teach us. That is the reality and the sadness of what is happening. They creep into houses 
and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Well, how do they creep into houses today? Well, you have a thing called a device, computers, televisions, and you click on, and you know when you click on one thing, and you start watching, and you find, oh, well, that's good. It feeds you other information. But what, what YouTube and these other, uh, uh, what do I call them? Social media people do is they don't care what is right and what is wrong and what is going to edify you or not. They want to make money from advertising. So if you watch that, well, the algorithm says maybe you'll watch that. And next minute you're watching something and it sounds right, but it's not quite right. And you've done the search, and what happens is you get this, the subtlety of the false, and, and sadly so today. That is what's happening on an exponential curve. And, you know, we have everybody is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is a, an expert now, you know. So when you go to the doctor and he's a specialist, you're going to go and tell him how he must operate on you now because that's what you've learned. And when you're looking at scripture, you, you know, this is what you are told to believe. They creep into houses. So be careful what you expose your mind to. I do not preach for the internet. I'm here for you folk. I'm here for you folk that are online. And yes, after the event, there are folks who download and watch our messages. But I am responsible to teach. I'm looking at you, and folks, I look at you and I say, if I don't teach you the truth, I'm going to lead you astray. And it is your responsibility to keep me accountable. It is the board's responsibility to keep me accountable as much as I'm here to share you the word. That is why anybody who, who doesn't, you know, who, who just has a, a YouTube account can say anything without any repercussion. And we are here, and we need to be careful that we stick and maintain the truth. Because if we don't, then we are going to be exposed to this kind of thing. Now, when Paul was writing to, to Timothy, did he know anything about TikTok and social media and, and television and all these things? He knew nothing of that. But who was inspiring the words that needed to be written down? But the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit knew exactly how to purpose the word to be written, to be relevant 2,000 years ago and to be relevant exactly 2,000 years later. Think about that. We read that and I read that and I'm thinking that could not have been Paul's thinking on his own. But by inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, knowing that you and I were going to be here 2,000 years later, knowing that we could look at this and be warned of this. You follow what I'm saying? Read on. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they, you're filling your mind with all sorts of stuff. Look at verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Who's Janus and Jambres? Who are you talking about here, Paul? Janus and Jambres. Well, if you had read the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 7, you would know that Moses had gone in, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and stood before Pharaoh and, and, and said, we are here, and, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of God, Jehovah God, to let the nation of Israel go. And they did the miracles in front and the, and the signs. And the Bible says that the, the Pharaoh got his, his magicians in. And in comes these magicians. And these magicians, the, the chief magicians... Their names happen to be Janus and Jambres, which you only find out to know through the writing of the Apostle Paul. You can read the whole Old Testament and you won't find their name. Now, why would that happen? Is that just, oh, by chance? I mean, have you ever been in a discussion with someone? Maybe you're going to say yes, Aiden, with you. But, and you, I'm, I'm telling you something and then... 
halfway through the conversation, I remember something. Oh, by the way, you must do... There's like a bit of information that's given, and it's like, why are you telling me that stuff? And you could almost look at this, you look at this verse, and you could say, but why would God purpose that this verse is in? To give us the names of Janus and Jambres. Hundreds of years after Exodus is written, Paul writes, and he, and he gives this information. Useless information. Well, is it? Let's read on. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But, now there's the but. So I'm telling you all this stuff, Timothy, all these things that you're going to face and that the, the church, the body of Christ is going to face. But, here's the solution. Here's how you're going to handle this. But thou hast fully known thy, my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Paul's saying, but Timothy, you know what I've been sharing, what I've been teaching. You know the, the truth. You know the manner of life and, 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 and my purpose and my faith, my long-suffering. <laughs> Can you imagine Paul teaching and teaching and being rejected and, you know, just continue sharing the message? Charity, charity, that's love in action, patience, persecutions, afflictions. Timothy, you know what I've been through, the imprisonments and the beatings and so forth, which came unto me, and then he says, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. I mean, you know, you just... Timothy, you saw what I went through, and, you, and you've seen how, how, how I've come through these things, what persecutions I endured, but out of them the Lord delivered me. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ, uh, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So, Timothy, you've seen what I went through, but don't worry, you've seen it. By the way, Everyone that's going to live godly in Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution in some way, shape, or form. If you are going to take a stand for the truth, you are not going to be popular. And as the world gets worse and worse and worse, you are going to be less and less and less popular. And those who creep into houses want to water down the truth so that they can get you to say, okay, well, maybe I'll just capitulate. Because it's easier to just keep quiet and not say anything rather than face the persecutions. You shall suffer persecution. That is why we need to gather like this, to edify one another, to encourage one another, to be encouraged in the word. That's why you need to stick in the word, because the word of God is going to keep on encouraging you. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This notion that we're going to go and fix the world for Jesus... That's not what the scripture says. It's going to get worse. The Lord is going to return and he will fix everything. But you and I at this point, if we're going to think we're going to go and fix the world for the Lord Jesus Christ and then say, okay, we fixed it, you can come back now. That's not going to happen. The scriptures tell us of that. But what do we do? Throw our hands up in the air. Let's read on. Paul gives us the answer. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Timothy, this is all that's going to go on. <laughs> How would you like to go for a job interview <laughs> and you get told, this is the stuff that's going to happen. <laughs> Do you want the job? <laughs> no. <laughs> These are the things that are going to happen. But what you need to do? Just the answer I'm going to give you. Just continue. What must you do? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned it. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Okay, now here's, here's the thing. What Scriptures did Timothy know at the time that Paul was writing? Was the New Testament Scriptures available to him? No. What Scriptures did he know? Timothy knew the Old Testament. By the way, who taught it to him? His mother and grandmother taught him the Old Testament scriptures. Would he have known the story of Exodus 7, of Moses going before Pharaoh? Yes. But would he have known, Paul gives him now the names, he confirms Janus and Jambres, he completes the story. Because here's what's 
this is this is my understanding uh, you know you, you take it for what you want look at the very next verse and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ jesus now if you read the old testament and you knew and understood the old testament was speaking of the prophetic coming of the lord jesus christ it can make you wise unto salvation. Timothy, reading the Old Testament, would not have known about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. For by, by faith in his blood, I'm going to be saved. He would not have known that only through further revelation of Scripture do we have that information. But he knew and understood what was happening through the Old Testament. And so I believe that the Holy Spirit puts this in that when he's been written to, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he adds Janus and Jambres, he like, completes the story for Timothy. You follow what I'm saying? It's like, aha. Because look what he's now going to say in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe the reason why Janice and Jambres' name is named in the writing of Paul to Timothy is because when Paul says all scripture, he's showing that all scripture from Genesis all the way through. So Timothy had the Old Testament in his mind. Now Paul, he's given this further information and he's here, heard Paul talking about the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul says all scripture, the Holy Spirit through Paul is confirming when Paul says all scripture, he's confirming everything. So we need to know the Old Testament. But we need to know the Old Testament in this way, that when we read the Old Testament and we see all the laws and the statutes, the Ten Commandments and the 603 other laws and statutes that the nation of Israel had to keep and maintain, that all it can tell us really is to say, whoa, you have fallen short of the glory of God. That's why Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have fallen short of the glory of God. You are not going to get saved by keeping the Ten Commandments or the, the 603 other laws and statutes because you're not going to be able to do it. You will fail. How do I know that? The scriptures tell us that, Romans 3.23. I will fail. I know that. I have failed. All of us have failed. And if you think you haven't, you just have because you've lied to your soul. Every one of us have failed in that way. So Paul ties this up and he says all scripture. So when you read through the scriptures and you read through the Old Testament, you get to the point and you say, well, I can't do this. Israel, the nation of Israel, thought, we can do this, Lord, you bring it on. <laughs> and they failed dismally. So when we look at it now today, when I look at this and I say all scripture, all that is written down, scriptura, that is which is written down on the page, the word of God, when you read God's word, and for me, when I read God's word in English and I read the King James 1611 version, I know I have every word that God would want me to have and to know in my language, English. If you speak uh, another language and it is preserved in your language, it would be that. And so we read this and it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, it doesn't inspiration God breathed and is profitable. It brings a prophet, hence the title of my message, Prophet from the Word. But what prophet am I going to get? For doctrine, that word doctrine is teaching. So if I read and believe and trust and study the scripture, I'm going to get the teaching of God's word. I'm going to understand what I need to know. But there is a formula which we told you last week, which Paul addresses to Timothy in, two, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where it says, Study, let me read it to you. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I heard a man quote that scripture yesterday. And guess what? When he got to the word dividing, he didn't say that word. Because he was quoting, and I could, and I was, right, right, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and he said, correctly teaching the word of God. Now, must we teach God's word correctly? Yes. But the verse says correctly, div rightly dividing. Why? Because as we showed you last, last week, we have to divide truth from truth and know what we need to apply today. We do not go out and offer animal sacrifices today for, uh, to, to have our sins paid for. Why? Because an animal sacrifice is going to mean nothing. It's going to mean nothing to me. 
If I think that offering a sacrifice, I build an altar in my backyard, and I mean, I know, look, I know there's some altars in the backyard, but that's for what we would term in South African terms a braai, or a barbecue. But that's not to come to God to have our sins paid for. So now I rightly divide the word and I say, it's in the word, it was required, but it is no longer required because I now have my, my conf uh, confidence in the fact that the scriptures declare that if I trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteous blood on the cross at Calvary, as I told the young men that were with me on Saturday, yesterday, if you do not believe and trust in the shed blood of Christ Jesus, that he paid for your sin on the cross, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again, then I'm sorry to tell you, but you will go to a lost eternity. And so I know that. And so when I, when I, when I understand what the word of God says and what Paul is saying here, it's, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. What's reproof? That's not the way... You're going the wrong way. This is not what you should be doing. God's word is going to reprove us. So if I read, believe, and trust God's word, guess what, folks? God's word's going to guide me. Now, I can do one of two things. I can ignore it, or I can heed it. And then correction. That's not the way you should be living. This is the way you should be living. Because I'm now studying the scriptures. And for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. And the man there is uh, anthropos, the man or woman of God, may be perfect. And that perfection is, now you do not have to study the scriptures and get 100% in your exam to be perfect enough to enter heaven. The perfection here is perfect in knowledge. Because you are saved, you are declared righteous by God through your faith in the living Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His shed blood. Your faith in that fact allows God to declare you righteous, allows the Holy Spirit to seal you. So you are declared righteous. But the perfect that Paul is talking about is perfect in knowledge. To come to that perfect knowledge. I certainly do not know every single thing that I need to know of Scripture. Even if I was to live another thousand years, I'd still be learning. I learn continuously. You listen to something, you read through something, and you look and say, wow. And, and the more you study, the more you get out of it. So I'm certainly not standing here teaching and say, listen, I've got all the answers. You just come to me. I'm saying God's word has got the answers. And if we don't find the answer, we need to keep reading, believing, trusting, and studying. And so Paul says that the man of God may be truly furnished. Why? Why do you have to have this perfect knowledge, this, this knowledge of God's word? Unto all good works. Because the more you read God's word, believe God's word, trust God's word, study God's word, the more it's going to get you to a point of being able to do the good work that God wants you to do. So we don't get into heaven by doing our good work. We get into heaven because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul writing to Timothy here says these things. He gives him these instructions. He's saying, this is what you're going to face, but this is how you're going to handle it. This is how you're going to deal with the issues and the challenges that you're going to face. This is how you're going to deal with the fact that even when things are going great, you know, because it's not just when things are going wrong that you need to, oh, well, I need to come to the Lord. The Word of God says, be careful that you don't trust in uncertain riches. So you can think, listen, I, whoa, I've got it packed. Down, you know, if I, listen, if I had so much in the bank, then I'd be okay. Really? You could lose it tomorrow. If I had this, so it's good to, we need to work, we need to earn a living, I understand all that, it's good to have that. But our, our trust must not be in the uncertain, that's what Paul calls them, uncertain riches. So it's not just when things are going bad that we, we're grappling and battling through uh, particular issues or challenges that we need to say, oh, you know, I, I'm going to come to you, Lord, because I need to get through this. We need to be careful that in studying the scriptures, even when things go well and we are successful in business, that we don't become high-minded. You follow what I'm saying? So, what do we do? Well, the first thing we are to do is to teach no other doctrine. And, we, and, and Paul warns Timothy about this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. The first letter he writes to Timothy, he says... 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's just read from verse 1. 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Notice his own son in the faith. He clarifies it. Grace, mercy, and peace. By the way, in Paul's greetings, he says grace and peace. When he writes to Timothy, he says grace, mercy, and peace. He says grace, mercy, and peace. And in 2 Timothy, um, he, again, he repeats, he says grace, mercy, and peace. Why doesn't he just say grace and peace? Well, he can, but why does he add mercy? Well, what's he telling Timothy? You're going to be facing some challenges, Timothy. So you're going to need God's grace. You're going to need some mercy. And you're going to need the peace of God living within your heart. God is not pouring out his wrath upon mankind today. Whatever happens or goes wrong with you in this life happens because you're part of a broken world. It's part of maybe choices you've made or choices other people have made against you or just chance. That's what happens. So God is not, so when you get sick today or a business fails or a relationship fails, it's not God saying, well, I'm going to cause that to go wrong in your life so I can teach you something. That's a common thing I hear people say, oh, well, you know, God is teaching you something because of this, that, or the next thing. If, what, did, what does God's word say? Paul writes to Timothy and he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If God is going to teach you anything today, how is he going to do it? Through his word. Through his word. Not through your circumstances. Now we take God's word that we learn and now we apply it to the circumstances. On Thursday evening, I joined the running group that I normally go to and we got and... Um, I noticed one particular lady had arrived and I hadn't seen her in a while. I said, oh, great to see you. How are you doing? And I could see the minute I asked that question, I struck a nerve. And she sort of like half walked away and I th she knows I'm in the ministry and I think, okay, now do you want to tell me something? Here? And we just stepped aside and she told me that um, she had been mugged and held up at knife point and her running kit and her bag and everything else had been stolen and they'd got her cell phone and they'd got her cards and they'd drawn money out and it, she's a single mom and it was really, really tough. And I know she's a Christian and don't answer, but what would you say in a situation like that? Think about it for a moment. Well, I can't remember everything I said, but I basically said to her, you know, God's word tells us in Romans 8, 37 to 39, nothing can separate us from his love. Do you know that what you were going through in the minute when you went through it, do you know that God was with you in that circumstance? And she says, well, I was okay, but <laughs> she started. Because she cried, because she realized the reality of what had happened. And she said, you know, it was amazing. I just stayed calm and gave them what they wanted. Now, I just mentioned that. And there's, there's many other folk that have faced many other challenges. You just have to look on. And, 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 I, and I look across, and I'm sure all of you here can relate in some way, shape, or form of something that has happened. And you think, how is that? And in your flesh, in, your, in the way that you react, you know, you, you can either just go absolutely like in a total state of shock. My brother and his wife were visiting us and they were telling us about the floods in East London and how they went to help one particular family. And they got there and the lady was just standing in absolute shock in her house, knee high in water, standing there. Why? Well, because it's the shock. So physically, listen, you are going to face issues and challenges. And as Christians, God does not expect you to say, oh, they're fine, okay, Lord, you yeah, I've got this. You can have emotional reaction. You can have fear. You can have just a state of, of, of shock and just not know how to respond in that particular, you know, the fight or flight. Some of us will just... <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the response is that you have, the physicality of that, I understand that. 
But it's after that. How do we deal with it? If we have God's word and we can put it into perspective, we deal with it in a way different way. You follow what I'm saying? And this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, these things are going to come at you. But you saw how I handled it. How did, how did Timothy handle it? Well, he handled it through the promises that God had given. That's why he knew. And yet, he says words like, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Paul in his flesh. I mean, think of this. This is a man who had met the, the Lord Jesus Christ face to face on the road to Damascus, had had further revelations through the years. None of us have had that privilege. And Paul, in seeing this, and he even records the fact that he'd seen into the third heaven, and he, you know, he can't even explain the things that he'd seen there. I mean, you would think a man like that should have no issues dealing with the physicality of life, right? Do you know where you're getting to? And yet he writes and says, oh, wretched man that I am. So who are you and I to not have those issues and challenges? As I say often to folks, it's okay to not be okay. But the answer to not being okay is not to stay like that. But to trust God and his word to help you through that circumstance. And for those in your family, friendship circles, and, and fellow believers to come around you and rally around you and to encourage you. And so, as we look at these things and as we see what Paul is writing to Timothy, the reason why Timothy is given this instruction, and he says uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went unto Macedonia. So Timothy was with him, and, and Paul had given instruction to Timothy. To, he says, yeah, you stay at Ephesus. I'm going on to Macedonia. Thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, pay attention to the words. That thou mayest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. He does not say, Timothy, go and be a nice guy there, and, and if they want to, let them teach the truth. Or be very nice, don't upset anybody, and just be, and let them teach what they want, as long as they don't make too much of a, of, that's not what Paul says, charge them. What does it mean to charge? Well, for those of you who've been in the military, thank you, 10 minutes. For those of you who've been in the military, well, uh, when, when the corporal says, Doop! Yeah, no, no, corporal. blad van boom. And you run and you come all the way back and says, Fakira boom, the ana boom. <laughs> Charge, to charge means to give instruction to make sure this is what it has to be. This is how it's got to get done. Why, why does Paul, he, he says, Timothy, charge them, give instruction. Don't undubash, if I can use that terminology. And if you're watching this and you're from overseas, what's the correct way to say undubash? Just go on with, uh, without regard. no. Be meek, gentle, but stand firm. Neither give heed to fables. What are fables? Stories. Now, I'm not talking about, you, you know, days of our lives and where you can watch it now and five years later you put it back on and the, you, you, yeah, anyway. Fables, fables. Talking, you know, that is why when we gather like this on a Sunday and we go through Scripture, we read Scripture, we look at Scripture, I can, yes, we can, tell, we can tell wonderful stories. But what does it edify? Now, I understand that part of giving an you know, explanation is bringing a story in, and I understand that. That's not what you're talking about. But fables, you know, these, these stories that are just getting told. Endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. So Paul tells Timothy, make sure that they teach no other doctrine. Why? Because the doctrine matters. And that's why in 2 Timothy he says, study. Timothy, you need to study. 
You need to study the Scripture. You need to rightly divide the Scripture so that you don't teach the wrong things. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Go with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And to us which are saved, it is the power of God. I could see in the facial expression of the one young gentleman, he thought I'd lost it when I was telling him about the fact that you have to trust in the shed blood of Christ, who is came to, to take on human form. And as God, in a, uh, he was the only one I could see sort of like, you know, foolishness. Maybe to him I was a fool in believing this. But to me, it's the power of God. And I said to them, guys, you need to understand, I'm not going to back down on this because this is what I believe to be the truth and I know to be the truth. Well, sir, it was really nice seeing you, and we, we agreed to disagree on the matter. Sadly so. But it's a, you, you, when you share something with someone, and if they don't believe and trust that, even if they think that you're foolish for believing what you believe, the question is, do you believe what you believe because you want people to think that you're right? Or do you, that you want people to like you for what you believe, or that you want people to think that you, you know, you, 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 you sort of have something really great. No, not everybody's going to think that. Some people are going to think that you are foolish for believing what you believe. But your faith in believing what you believe must not be based on the response of others, but rather on the fact and the truth that you know which is contained in God's word. That even at the point, if you were standing there and, you, and this is what you believed, and there was nobody else that stood around you that believed what you believed, that you knew and understood that you have the God of creation living within you, and even if you were alone, that you are not alone, for you have the creator God who walks with you every single moment of every single day. That and even when you think you're alone and in your flesh you feel alone, you are not alone. The Bible says the angels watch and learn from us. That's not just the good angels, it's the fallen angels. The spiritual realm, right now, they are hearing and they're listening and looking at what we're sharing, and they, I, I, I can just imagine, how can that guy, that sinful man, dressed in, in, in all green today, even though the cricketers lost the match, How can he dare say what he's saying? We know what he's been up to in his life. We know that he's, well, the scriptures declare me righteous. God's word gives me the right to stand here because I do not stand in my own right. I stand here because it's God's word that I need to bring across to you and in, in the strength of that, point you to God's word that not to my life. Not to say, you better just do this because this is, this is, I'm showing you how to live. Now, yes, we should be an example. We understand that, right? It's the power of God. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? Romans chapter 1, not in my notes, but just go with me there. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now think about what Paul has told Timothy, that you've seen my persecutions in Iconium, at Lystra, and all these places. You've seen what's happened to me, Timothy. Think about this, where Paul writes in Romans, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's saying, 
<laughs> I'm not here to gain popularity. I'm here to stand on the truth of God's word. So if I share God's word with you, and because I share God's word with you, you get it, you read it, you believe it, you trust it, and it works within your life, and, 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 and you love me and care for me for that, fantastic, thank you. <laughs> you know, we need, to, we need to be there for one another for that. But it, is, it, it, it has to be your responsibility to make sure you learn and get the truth of God's word. And it is the power of God. Even when folks think you've lost it. Second Corinthians. Go with me to Second Corinthians. And I'm running out of time. And nonetheless, we'll keep on. The clock didn't work last week. And I said to Michelle this morning, this Michelle in front, not the other Michelle behind, um, that if my clock stopped, it will give me an excuse to carry on. But it's working. So it's told me. Um, where did I tell you to go? Second Corinthians chapter five, and uh, let's read from verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judged that if one died for all, then we were all dead. The love of Christ constraineth us. Just think about that. Think about, think about when, a, when, a, when a, a child maybe is going and something happens and they, they're fearful or they're crying or whatever. Uh, what do they normally do? Run to mommy or daddy or granny, grandpa or whoever and, you know, hold me, hug me. Hold me, constrain me, hold me. The love of Christ constraineth me because we thus judge that if one died for all, we are all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. There we go. So the fact that we believe it, we shouldn't be living unto ourselves, but as an example, as ambassadors of Christ, which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. Paul talking about the fact there was a time that the Lord Jesus Christ walked on the face of the earth, earth and he was physically with the believers, right? Now, we don't have him physically walking with us today, but do we have him any less? No. Why? Because as a believer, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says that you are sealed with and by the Holy Spirit. And to have the Holy Spirit living within you is to have the life of Christ. Wow. wow. But I can't see Jesus. I can't touch him. But, but, I, but, if I, but I, can, I can take the scriptures. I have them. And if I believe them and trust them. You see, this is why the enemy doesn't want you to believe that the scripture is God's word. That it's just another book. But if it is God's word and it is true, and you read it, it's real. It's real. You, can't, you don't have to see it to know that it is real. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit being living within you, that you see God's word, you read it, you believe it, and it teaches you and shares you the, the, the truth. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And that's not... You know, maybe or maybe you aren't. If you believe and trust Jesus Christ paid for your sin on the cross at Calvary, you believe he shed his blood for you, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. Are you in Christ? Yes or yes? Yes, you are. So, if any man be in Christ. So, as a believer, are you in Christ? Right? So, if you're in Christ, which you are as a believer, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Your soul, you, you are declared righteous. You are a new creature in Christ. The problem is you're still left in your old body. So you're still going to grapple in, with the physicality of life and the way that we are wired in terms of our physicality. And that's why Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And every one of us here have our own challenges that we deal with in some way, shape, or form. Maybe I have anger outbursts, and I need to control that. Maybe I have a, 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 an, a, an alcohol challenge. Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's whatever it is. Maybe it's a combination of things. 
We grapple and we battle through that. But you are a new creature in Christ. So now go out and live like it. Believe that's who you are. And all things are of God. And hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Where was God in Christ? Reconciling the world on the cross. And I, and I think about that and how, how can somebody say G Jesus was not God? How can a sinful man pay for another man's sin? Follow what I'm saying? And, and, and have God impute that righteousness. Unless that man was the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Now then, we're ambassadors for Christ as though God had beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Now be, be ye reconciled to God. Notice he says, beseech you. Now he doesn't say, charge you. You better do this. We say, because of who you are, I implore you to now go out and be the ambassador that you need to be. For you've made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Folks, we'll end there. Pick this up next week. Because I want to talk to you about the fact that Satan is the father of the deception and the lies which are getting put out there today. And we need to be careful how this is done. But we'll look at that next week. Amen? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And as we can have gathered around your word today, may you continue to guide us and teach us the things we need to know. We pray this in and through Christ Jesus. Amen.